Howdy, and welcome to the Breakaway Podcast. Thanks for listening. Breakaway is a Bible study that meets on the campus of Texas A&M. For more information on Breakaway, please visit breakawayministries.org. We hope you enjoy the talk. Well, it's official. The data is in. There is a severe shortage of kindness in America. Uh, The PR firm Weber Shandwick releases an annual report on civility in America, and according to the most recent report, nine in ten Americans say our culture is increasingly less civil, that uncoolness has reached epidemic proportions in America. And we see it everywhere. You see it in celebrity feuds, you see it in the way people shame one another online, you see it in politics, the name calling, those sorts of things, you see it all over the place, this us versus them mentality. And last week we talked about that, that our culture increasingly has a hostile this group versus another mentality, but God calls us to something else because God is about something else. God's about breaking through boundaries and crossing lines and seeking the outsider. That God loves even those who consider themselves his enemy. That he draws near to those who are far off. That's who God is. And the people of God are meant to be like that. We're meant to be a part of that with him. We're meant to join him on the quest of initiating conversations with people that don't love us or even like us, to invite people into our homes, strangers, even people that we don't get along with in the name of Jesus, extend love to them. And last week we talked about strategies of how to do that, how to bring the love of Christ to those who don't know him and haven't enjoyed his love. We talked about the how last week, but there's a problem that we didn't address, and that's the problem of why. Why would I want to do that? Because some of us, if we're honest, we're like, you know what, Ben, there's people that have hurt my feelings, and I don't want to forgive them. There's people I don't like, and I don't want to like them, right? And so I can keep giving you strategies of how to love people, But strategies are worthless if the motivation's not there, right? That's true of everything in life. Like, I imagine if I came to you and we talked any topic, uh, getting in shape, right? General fitness, eating right, working out, studying. If I asked you good strategies to succeed with your health or your studies, I bet you could give me a great strategy, right? And yet for many of us, we know how we're supposed to eat, know how we're supposed to exercise, know how we're supposed to study. But if I said, how's that working for you? You'd go, well, yeah, you know, it's kind of, mm. <laughs> I know I should eat celery, but at three o'clock, it's like celery, donut, I'm eating the donut. You know, like I, I know a good strategy to be healthy, but there's no motive to do it, right? And so the reality is I can say, man, we should do this great what of loving our enemies, But if we're honest, the question rises up in us, why? Why? Because I don't want to love them. If we're honest, we're like my daughter. I love it when I tell her to do things. My three-year-old has gotten in this habit where I'm like, hey, you need to clean up the playroom. She'll go, dad, I can't want to. (laughs) And it's so true. She's like, it's like she's trying to find it. She's like, no, it's not there. No, (laughs) digging deep for the motivation, dad, it's not there. I just can't want to right? And that's the problem. Like, I could keep giving you sermons on how to love people, and you're like, that's sorry, that was so powerfully delivered. But then you're going to go and not do it because you don't want to, right? And I get that. I totally get that. Uh, I think it's been long enough uh, for me to tell this story. I remember when I first came to Breakaway, uh, there was um, a student who came to me, and he was the leader of an organization that now no longer exists. And uh, he came to me and said, hey, we're part of this Christian organization. We're running this Uh, uh, events all week long focused on uniting the body of Christ. And they said, here's the deal. We contacted this nationally known speaker and this nationally known band, and we booked them for Tuesday night. We told them they could lead at Breakaway. So on Tuesday night, we're taking over Breakaway, and this band's going to lead worship, and this guy's going to speak. I remember this kid sat down across the table from me, and I was like, "Uh, I don't know you. Like, you can't take over. Like, I have a board of directors. I have people I answer to. Like, I don't know who you are. You can't just come in and take over Breakaway. No. No, I can't do it. I don't know why you would book it when it's not yours. You don't even volunteer here. And I'll never forget. I remember he looked at me, and he said, um, he said, look, 
He said, I don't want to have to compete against you, but I will. <laughs> and I remember when he said that, something inside me was like, you little, right? And I just got so angry, like something's like urge to kill, raging. I'm like, God, I want to hurt him. I want to hurt him. And then I was just like, I just had to end it because I was like, I'm going to do something that's going to cost me my job, you know? So I just kind of said something like, well, we'll see about that, you know? And I kind of walked <laughs> off and I was like, oh man. And I was trying to think of a way, like, how do I burn this kid down? Like get online and be like, this kid's a liar and a thief and a cruel person. I was like, what do I do? Right. And I just got to this point where I, I just felt like God was saying, Ben, you got to love him. And I remember calling a board member and going, I'm about to do something crazy uh, to a college kid. And he was like, hey man, you got to love him. Why don't you pray for him? And I was like, because I don't want to. I don't want to love him. I want to punish him, right? And we're like that. There's people in our lives that get on our nerves. You're like, I don't want to love that guy. He's not pulling his weight in our group project. I want to punish him. And not physically, but, you know, just kind of psychologically or passive aggressively or something like that. Or, man, I got someone in this social group I don't like, and so I want to sabotage their leadership attempts. Or you go, there's different people that I don't like him, and I don't want to like him. It's empowering. I could talk to you and say, man, I'm just supposed to forgive that person. I'm supposed to love him. Or I can just say, you know what? Now we got bad blood. <laughs> I think there's a problem, right? And there's something about that of going, man, you hurt me. You steal my backup dancers before my tour. I'm going to get my squad together and make a video with them, right? To show them that everybody loves me and nobody loves you, right? If you're not up on T-Swift's uh, drama, don't worry about it. But some of you go, look, Ben, I don't want to hurt anybody. You go, Ben, I don't want to hurt anybody. So you know what I do? I just ignore them and I tolerate them. I'm going to take the high road of toleration, which if you look at the definition of toleration, it means to allow the existence of something. Isn't that just a beautiful society? <laughs> How do you want to build this community? One where I just endure your existence. Thanks, man. We should start a club together. No. <laughs> Jesus calls us to something more. Jesus says, love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. Do good to them. Initiate with them. Carry their burdens physically, literally. Initiate loving that person. And some of us hear that, and I'm joking around, but we're being honest. Like, there's people in our lives that you go, you know what? I don't have to, I don't want to extend love to that person. He's rude, she's mean, they hurt me. I don't want to forgive them. I don't want to love them. And Jesus calls us to, and if we're going to take Jesus seriously, he calls us to love. And so for the people who would say, I'm on board with Jesus tonight, we need to figure out the motivation of why. And what I love about the Bible is the motivation is never just do it. God is gracious enough to give us motivations. And we're going to find three of them tonight in this kind of final section of Jesus connecting with an outsider, we're going to see three motivations for loving our enemies, doing good to those who hate you. And you see it in Luke 23 when Jesus is having one of his final encounters with people who are outside of his core circle, outsiders to the faith. They're the people who were crucifying him. And I won't take you through the whole story, but in Luke 23, 33, after his trial, after his condemnation, after his whipping... It says of the soldiers, and when they came to the place that's called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. The final outsiders I want to look at as we're talking about Jesus and the outsiders are the they in this passage, the men who were actively crucifying him, driving nails into his arms. And while they are in the act of killing him, Jesus prays for God to forgive them. He asks for God to do good for them. How can he do that? And some of you go, well, he's Jesus. He's just using his Jesus powers, and, you know, that's good for him. I can't do that. Well, if you're a follower of Jesus, you can and here in this statement, we find three reasons or motivations to love our enemies. And the first one is found in the first word he says, Father. Father. That I can find a motivation to love my enemies in what? In my confidence as a beloved child of God. 
See, in that moment where these people were actively hurting Jesus, he was able to see past them into heaven and see a God who is his father. And there's a stability in that. 1 Peter 2 says that when Jesus was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. Why? Because he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. I know that God controls my future, not these men. So I don't have to revile them back because my life is entrusted to the one who does right by me. Hebrews 12 says of Jesus that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. While he was being crucified, he knew there was joy in the future. Why? Because God controls my destiny, not these men. And God has a future for me, and it's a future with a throne ruling with him. And so God is able to be gracious because he can see past them that I have a father in heaven, and that gives me confidence and stability because I'm a beloved son. And that's not just there for him. It's there for all who believe in him. Galatians 4 says this, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. For those who've embraced Jesus, it says that we have an intimate love with God. He is in us and with us, and he's our Abba, Father. And we have a future. We're an heir. We get to inherit his kingdom. And so that we are secure in his love. And when I'm insecure in his love, I can handle your hate. You see in 1 John 3, it says, Behold, what kind of love the Father's given to us, that we should be called children of God. And such we are. The reason why the world doesn't know us is that it didn't know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we'll be like him because we'll see him as he is. He's saying that when we come to know Jesus Christ, we're made children of God. That means we're intimately loved by God now and he holds our future into forever that we will be with him and we will be like him. And let me tell you something. When you understand that level of abundance, it frees you up to be generous, even to the cruel. Because we are generous when we operate from a position of abundance. We are. Think about it with anything. Driving. If you have an abundance of time, if you left the house hours early, you are gracious when you operate from a position of abundance. So you left two hours early for your class. What happens? The light turns red twice when you're on George Bush. You go, that's okay. Someone forgot to get in the right lane. You're like, it's all right. Merge, right? Someone makes a mistake and cuts out too easy and you look at them like, oh, look at you, I do the same thing, I know. (laughs) And you're free to be gracious because you have an abundance of time. But what happens when you run late? Suddenly everyone is a moron, right? (laughs) And you're tailgating going, come on, grandma, get off your phone. What's the matter with you? What's with these people? I'm going to hit them. I'm going to hit them, right? (laughs) And just everyone is getting on your nerves when there's scarcity Rage, right? Think it if you have plenty of people who are attracted to you. Suddenly all these different people are hitting on you. All these people are interested in you. And a friend comes and goes, hey, I think they're kind of cute. You go, go ahead. Take a shot. That's great. But what if you have one person that showed interest in you? One person that you like and a friend of yours starts talking to them, just talking to them at a party. You're like, what is, what is she doing? Why is she doing that? Why is she talking? Did she touch his arm? I'm going to kill her. I'm going to, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Y'all come here. Everyone, I need to trash her right now. No, it can't wait. I'm going to destroy her socially right now to you, right? Like I've got to hurt you because there's scarcity. And where there's scarcity, there's insecurity. And where there's insecurity, there's hostility. Bank on it. But where there's abundance, we can be gracious. And let me tell you something. You see it all the time in our culture. People feel a scarcity. And that's what makes you hostile. Because you're afraid they're going to take something from me I don't have enough of. Some of you, when a prof grades unfairly, you go, eh, we'll get them next time, right? Because grades aren't really where you find your security. 
Others of you, if a prof just doesn't do it exactly like he said he was, you get furious. What's the matter with him? I'm going I'm to get him fired. I'm going to come after this guy. And you get so angry. Why? Because maybe you said these grades are where I find significance and value, and he's threatening to take not just my grade, but my significance and value. Or I told all these people I would graduate on this time, and if he messes up my graduation date, I have to go back to them. He's going to embarrass me, and I'm going to lose status. I'm going to lose status because that moron, and I hate him, right? And our anger and our unwillingness to forgive comes why? Because our security feels threatened. Our security feels threatened. But as a Christian, we have abundance. We have an abundance of love. We have an abundance of security that we look up in the heavens and say, I have God as a dad, and he loves me. He's my father. And so if you come at me and you're rude to me, I'm okay because I have plenty of love, plenty of love to give. If you come to me and you steal an opportunity from me, he holds my future. You ultimately can't ruin my future. He holds me. I've got a family. I've got connection. I've got answers. I've got hope. And so I am free to forgive and be generous because of him, regardless of what you do. So David in the Old Testament, when he and his men were slighted by Nabal, he got furious and he said, I am going to kill that man. I love it the way he says it to his men. He says, so help me God if I don't kill every single man in that guy's household. And in the original language, he doesn't say man. He says, I'm going to kill everyone who stands and pees on a wall. We don't translate it that way. I don't know why. <laughs> but that's what he said. Why did he say it that way? It's to tip you off that he is absolutely bonkers out of his mind angry that this person took respect from him, disrespected him in front of his men. So he was like, so help me God, every guy peeing on a wall's dead tonight, right? And he goes riding off with his boys like, I'm going to kill them all. And what happens? Abigail steps in front of that procession of anger. And what does she tell David? She tells him, you don't have to lash out on this fool. She says, because God holds your future. You're his son. You're his heir. He's going to take care of you. He's going to give you a throne, David, so you can forgive even him. And David thanks her for saving him from wasting a lot of time with hate and anger. Ends up marrying her. He's like, thank you. And what are you doing later, right? <laughs> because if I have a father in heaven who loves me, because I am his beloved, I'm free to love. Do you see that? It's from that security that I can be gracious. That's what the Christian has, right? That we have the security of God. Now, does that excuse what people do to us when they hurt us? No. Jesus says, Father, forgive them. What's the assumption when he asks for their forgiveness? That what they're doing is wrong. When a Christian is gracious to an enemy, that doesn't mean you overlook, minimize, or deny that what they did hurt you or was evil. His disciples will later say the act of crucifying Jesus was pure evil. And for some of you, there are people in your life that what they did to you was wrong. There's no excuse for it. It's bad. You don't have to call it any less than that. The Bible doesn't. The Bible doesn't minimize sin. If anything, God holds a much higher view of it than you do. And so what they were doing was awful. And you don't have to call someone hurting you or saying mean things about you or slighting you or being disrespectful to you as anything less than that. You can let it stand at the full height of its ugliness. But the good news is where sin abounds, grace abounds more. And you can go, but God forgives me and cares for me even more than this hurt. So when they hurt me, yes, I can be discouraged. Yes, I can be frustrated, but I'm never destroyed. I'm never destroyed because I have confidence because I'm a beloved child. Do you see that? When my feet are planted, I'm very hard to knock down. When I'm secure, you can't shake me. So the more you press into the fatherhood of God, the more secure a human being you're going to be, and the more easy it will be for you to be generous to even the people who hurt you. Our other motivation, our second one, is not just the confidence that comes that I'm from a child of God, but my compassion because they're blind captives. He says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. How can Jesus forgive these men while they are driving spikes through his hands? How can he do that? He says, because they don't know what they're doing. Sure they do. They crucify people all the time. 
They know what a nail does to human flesh. They know what they're about to do to him. There's a level at which that doesn't work. Yes, they know what they're doing. They know and have every intention to hurt him until he dies. They know what they're doing. What does he mean? What he means is they don't know fully. They don't fully grasp what's happening here. There's a blindness to them, to the fullness of the reality around them. And Paul in 2 Corinthians calls it a spiritual blindness. That's not just the case for these crucifiers of Jesus, but for every person who does not know God through faith in Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, it says, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbeliever to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who's in the image of God. These men knew they were killing somebody. What they didn't know is that they were murdering the Son of God. That the only innocent person on the planet, the one who created the mountains they got that metal from, that's the one they're driving the spikes to. The one who came up with the idea of wood is the one they're nailing to a tree. They don't grasp fully what's happening here. Why? Because they're spiritually blinded. They just can't see it. They're victims of a blindness that God has to remove, that the enemy of God, that in 2 Corinthians 4 is called the God of this world, has blinded them, right? And so when I look at someone who's not a Christian, that's mean to me, cruel to me, slights me, says something rude to me online, I go, Lord, forgive them because they don't know. They don't know. Now, do I say that from a place of arrogance? No. It's not that I figured something out they're not smart enough to figure out. As you keep reading 2 Corinthians 4, it says, we don't, what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord. And we're your servants for Christ's sake. For the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, shone into our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Paul says, it's not that we figured it out. The Christian doesn't feel superior to the people who don't know God through Jesus Christ. Why? Because we aren't more smart We aren't more spiritual even, in a sense. We aren't more talented. We just had God graciously make us unblind. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones said it this way. He said, it's the height of foolishness. If there was a group that was blind and one of us was given eyes to see, someone graciously restored our sight, it would be foolish for you to walk up to the other blind people and go, what's the matter with you? Why are you blind? Stop being blind. You you didn't stop yourself from being blind. It was grace. And so the Christian is kind with the person who doesn't see that what they're doing is is cruel or mean or, or unkind. They don't see the full ramifications of it, that to dishonor someone made in the image of God is cruel. That James talked about that. With our mouths, we curse, uh, bless God, but curse men who are made in God's image that we make fun of people who are made in the image of God, that you have glory and dignity, so to mock you online, even if you deserve it, is uncalled for, unacceptable. Heaven groans at it, but so many people can't see it because they're blind. Or not just blind, 2 Timothy will say they're captives. 2 Timothy 2.23 says, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed corals. Quarrels. This is Paul talking to his young 20-something disciple of saying, hey, Christian, there's going to be some people who want to debate with you, and it's not going to be to heighten knowledge. It's just going to kind of cross lightsabers of our philosophical knowledge to see who read more or memorized more so it can win. And he says, don't do it. When someone wants to get in a spiritual debate with you in the middle of campus, just say, I don't want to play. I don't want to fight. You win. Are we in a fight? You win. I don't want to do that. Why? Because he says it only breeds fights. And in verse 24, he says, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. You don't pick fights. But we're kind to everyone. Able to teach. Know what you believe. Patiently enduring evil. Correcting your opponent with gentleness. Are there gentleness in your tweets? Let me give you motivation to put it there. If God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Paul says, Timothy, 
There's people who are going to make fun of you, yell at you, attack you philosophically, call you dumb, backwards, regressive. All these things. Don't fight back, Timothy. Don't fight back. And you're like, why? I can do it. I can take them, boss. And he says, you be gentle with them. Why? Because when you see them, Timothy, don't see enemy. See captive. See captive. Someone who doesn't even know what they're doing. Because when I see an antagonist who's a non-Christian as a blinded captive, I can have compassion. There's not many people I geek out about in life, but uh, I fangirled a little bit at at an airport uh, in Mississippi. I was sitting there by myself flying home, and I looked up, and I saw John Perkins uh, buying some like gummy bears or something. I don't know. He's in snack bar. And I was just like, oh my God. Oh my God, that's John Perkins. And I did this so weird thing where you kind of like walk up next to him and I'm just kind of like, oh, that's him. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. I'm staring at him. I'm making it weird. I can't stop making it weird. Right. And, uh, finally he turned and said hi to me. And I said hi to him because John Perkins had a profound effect on my life when I was in college, uh, because of the life he lived. That John Perkins was not a Christian. Uh, growing up, when he was a sharecropper in cotton fields, and, and he moved to California, got an education, came to Christ because of a Sunday school teacher for his daughter. Because of that, he felt a burden and conviction for the poor in Mississippi, and he moved back to be a minister and he began to minister in a very dangerous time for a black man to minister in Mississippi in the 60s and in the 70s. And in his book, Injustice for All, he tells the story in a chapter entitled Love is Stronger Than Hate about a night where he and some friends were in two vans. They were dropping off some young men at a college after they had been a part of a civil rights rally. And then one of the vans was pulled over and arrested by the police. And so his van pulled over, went to the police station. And he says, when we arrived, a dozen officers exited the beating, uh, exited the building and began to beat John and the men with him. No questions, just started hitting him. And then they brought him into the jailhouse, and he says this in the book, inside the jailhouse, the nightmare only got worse. At least five deputy sheriffs and seven to 12 highway patrolmen went to work on us. And he goes into detail about being beaten, stomped on the floor, having a fork rammed up into his nose. And he says, this went on through the night until the men with him thought he was dead. But then this is what John wrote about that moment and why he's one of my heroes. He says, I remember their faces so twisted with hate. It was like looking at white-faced demons. But then he says this. For the first time I saw what hate had done to those people. These policemen were poor. They saw themselves as failures. The only way they knew how to find a sense of worth was by beating us. Their racism made them feel like somebody. And when I saw that, I just couldn't hate back. I could only pity them. And I said to God that night, God, if you will let me get out of this jail alive, and I really didn't think I would, I really want to preach a gospel that will heal these men too. Well, although the students who watched me through the night in that jail cell were sure for a while that I was dead, I came out alive. And with that, a new call. My call was to preach the gospel now, extending to the whites. That back in the 60s, in the middle of so much racial tension and hostility, while being beaten in a prison cell, he looked up and he saw the men beating him, not as enemies, but as captives. Captives to hate that was defacing not just him, but them, marring the image of God in them. And so when you can see they're, they're blinded, they're captives, they don't see. Even while they're beating them, he felt compassion. He longed for them to know a God who could restore the glory of the image of God in man. Do you see that? The only way we're going to overcome hate and anger is if I can see you that way. You are made in the image of God You are marred by sin, but the grace of God can restore that image. That's how the Christian sees the person who disagrees with them. Now, let me say for a minute, if you're not a Christian in this room and you're like, wait a second, you're saying that Christians look at me and say, I can have pity on you because you're a blinded captive spiritually. Uh, Isn't that a, a little condescending? 
Well, let me just say non-Christian, what's the alternative? They would say, I see you as spiritually not able to see the glory of God in the face of Christ. What's the alternative? The alternatives are what a lot of people do in political social spheres. If you disagree with me on an issue, we say, well, you don't believe what I do about political issues because you're an idiot. Or you don't believe what I do as social because you're a moron, because your DNA got inbred and you're, you're crazy. You're past saving. You should be put out to pasture somewhere, right? Typically, the people we disagree with, we dehumanize them. Do you see what the Christian does? They raise you up and say, even if you rage at me, you have dignity because you're made in the very image of God. So the Christian is meant to be kind to you and gracious with you. Even if you're not gracious back, Christians have often not done well at this. But this is our standard from our Lord. And when it's done well, man, it's beautiful. And that's what you see as our last point. What's our last motivation? I can love my enemies. Why? Because I have confidence as a beloved child of God. I have compassion because I see a blinded captive. And because I know that love brings change. Love brings change. When they nailed Jesus to that cross in Luke 23, he forgave his persecutors. He suffered without insults. He offered grace to the criminal next to him and comforted him as he died. He confidently claimed, I will be in paradise on this day. And then his last words were a cry of trust in Luke 23, 46. It says, then Jesus called out with a loud voice saying, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now look at verse 47. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, He praised God, saying, certainly this man was innocent. What happened? Jesus' death on the cross procured salvation for this man. The way Jesus suffered on that cross drew the man in. That the guy had seen a bunch of people crucified. And if you look at the history of crucifixions, it's always the same. You scream like crazy when they're nailing you to the cross. As people mock you, you mock them back, you scream at them, you try to pee on them. It's a humiliating, ugly, disgusting way to die. And he sees a man get up there that while they're mocking him, he doesn't mock them back. He starts to pray for God to be merciful to them. While they're nailing his arms in, they hear him whisper into their ears, God, forgive these men. While this man was mocking him, and then suddenly as he faces death, turns, he comforts him while he's dying. And then his last words were, Father, I trust you with my life. And when this centurion watched him do that, it says he started praising God. He's like, I have never seen someone take suffering like that. I've never seen someone handle evil like that. I've never seen someone be kind to their enemies like that. And it made a crucifier into a worshiper. Do you see that? It made the hostile attentive. It made the indifferent suddenly invested that love brings change. It does all the time. Ravi Zacharias in his book, Can Man Live Without God, told a beautiful story, and I'll end with this here. He was talking about the sufferings of Christians in Yugoslavia and the sufferings of the people that had been perpetrated by the politicized church of Yugoslavia. Corruption was rampant in the church, And then one day, an evangelist named Yaakov arrived in a village, and he befriended an elderly man named Simmerman. I'm probably butchering their names, but there they are. And he was commiserating with this elderly man about the suffering that he and his family had endured. And while he did it, Yaakov transitioned the conversation into the love of Jesus, the love that's available through Jesus. And the old man cut him off and said, I want nothing to do with your Christianity. And then he started going down the list of the history of the church in that town. This church has plundered people, exploited people, killed innocent people. My own nephew was killed by that church. He says, and they wear their little coats and caps that show a picture of them being commissioned by the heavens, but they're evil and I can't ignore their evil. I will not accept them. And as this old man raged against young Yakov, he, he told him a story. He said, okay, I want you to imagine for a minute that somebody broke into your house and stole your coat and then robbed a bank. 
And as the authorities investigated and got involved, witnesses say they saw a man running off wearing your coat. He said, let's say the authorities came to your house and banged on the door and said, hey, we're taking you in. You robbed that bank. He said, what would you say? And he said, I would tell them it wasn't me. And he said, and they would tell you, well, we know it was you because we saw your coat. We saw your coat. It was you. And the story says that as Yakov said that, the man became irritated and kicked him out of the house. He said, I don't want you here. Beat it. But this young man would come back to that village day after day and was gracious to this old man even when he was mean back, was kind even when he reviled him, was gentle to this old man. And then finally one day this elderly man came to him and just asked the question, okay, how do I become a Christian? And he told him. And it says he bent his knee to the soil and surrendered his life to Jesus. And as he rose to his feet, wiping his tears, he embraced the young man and said, thank you for being in my life. And then he pointed up to heaven and said, you wear his coat well. That the way Jesus suffered with his enemies gave people a picture of God that was attractive. And when the people of Jesus are kind to our enemies, gentle with those who revile us, it will make Jesus look attractive. His coat, we will wear it well, and it will draw people in to meet him. I praise God I had a board of directors that day. I was mad at that student because I called them because I was like, I'm on the edge. I'm about to go postal. And these elderly wise men in my life said, do nothing, do nothing. Go home and pray for this young man. And I did. And then they said, cancel breakaway that night and let him run his event. Just cancel, step out, let him run it. And I was like, you're giving in to the enemy. And they were like, no, just, just let go, man. Just let it go. And so a couple weeks later, I don't remember how long it had been, the young man came back to me and said, hey, we booked all these people and aligned all this stuff, and he misunderstood, uh, uh, miscalculated how much everything it would cost, all that he rented, all that he put together. They had no money, and he was bankrupting the organization. So he came to me and said, will you fund it? And I said, I can't. I said, it's not my money. Like, people donate to Breakaway and, and I have a board of directors I answer to that, I, that I'm charged with. I, I can't give it all over to you. We don't have much money anyway, man. Like, uh, I, I can't. And then he just started to sob because in his pride, he had alienated people and, and done some rude things. And yet here he was broken. And he began to weep with me. And I got to put my arm around him and got to pray for him. And I remember sitting there and marveling at this, that this person I had considered an enemy God was now using me to comfort in the name of Jesus, that it was going to be okay. And I thought, thank you, Lord, that I didn't give in to snide comments, rude remarks, being rude back, reviling back, that I trusted God with breakaway. And when I do that, God lets me be a part of extending his love, and his love changes people. It makes enemies into friends. That's the gospel. Well, howdy, and welcome to the Breakaway Podcast. My name is Hannah, and I'm sitting here with Ben Stewart after Breakaway on a Tuesday night. And um, we had some special guest worship leaders with us tonight. We had the uh, Austin Stone's Jimmy McNeil with us tonight. And we love the Austin Stone. Those guys are awesome. And it was um, such a great night of worship. And yeah, um, love them. It's powerful. I mean, Jimmy is such a good leader. I mean, he has an amazing voice, but it's just leadership is so strong and uh, and just love what they're doing over there. So mm-hmm. their their worship album comes out this week. Yeah. And uh, if you're, you should check it out. I mean, they're just, they're really doing some great things over there. Definitely. Yeah. Love those guys. Well, the reason why we do these back end of the podcast, if you're not aware, um, we don't have a ton of time on a Tuesday night. And so since it's limited, we like to... Um, add some additional thoughts in the back here. So Ben, is there anything else you wanted to say to everyone here on the podcast? Well, there is, Hannah. I want to address one thing <laughs> that should probably have been its own sermon, but I'm going to, I won't make it that. I'll keep it tight here. But I want to answer a question that I think some people might be asking this, and, and that is, there's something about that statement, forgive them 
because they don't know what they're doing. That I think some people could catch on that of going, okay, if they don't know what they were doing, why do they need to be forgiven? Forgive them because they know not what they do. Like, uh, they didn't know. So if, if you don't know any better, sh- do you need to be forgiven? What's going on with that? I don't understand. How can they be culpable if they're not knowledgeable of what they're doing? Some people might wrestle with that. Mm-hmm. And I just want to answer that quickly of, um, in the Bible, ignorance does not equal innocence. You can be clueless and guilty. And you go, why? Mm, it, it's the same with our laws. Like if you're speeding and a police officer pulls you over, you can say, I didn't know. But he'd say, well, you're still culpable. Why? Because that information was accessible to you. The fact that you didn't grasp it, attain it, um, does not mean it wasn't out there for you to see. Mm. And the Bible will go further and say, it's that you didn't want to see it. The problem is not a lack of information. It's a lack of inclination. That's the Bible's descriptor of we're not just blind captives. We're blind captives that love being captive. Mm -hmm. Uh, The book of Romans, Romans 1, will say we suppress the truth in our ungodliness. It's not that um, there's this truth out there and, oh gosh, if we could just find it. Romans 1 says part of the sinfulness of humanity is we suppress the truth in our ungodliness. We say, I don't really want to think about what's true. I want to marshal around myself arguments that... Um, promote whatever I want to do. Mm. Uh, you see that earlier when when Jesus is interacting with Pilate. You know, Pilate comes to him and says, you know, so are you a king? And Jesus asks him, are you asking me that or did someone put you up to that? He's asking Pilate, do you really want to know? And Pilate was like, no, your people are accusing you. I don't care. Am I a Jew? He's like, I, I'm just trying to be politically expedient and I'm annoyed that I'm in this moment. And Jesus tells him, my kingdom's not of this world. I'm not a political threat. Mm. Uh, but, I, you know, but I am a king. And he goes beyond that and says, um, I've come here to preach the truth, and whoever is on the side of truth listens to me. He's telling Pilate, like, you need to... I'm telling you who you're talking to right now. Um, I speak the truth, and everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And Pilate says, what is truth, and walks out. And you realize Pilate doesn't want to know what's true. He just wants whatever's most convenient for him at the time. And what I found with a lot of folks is uh, what Ravi Zacharias used to say is really true. Our intent precedes content, that we will form data to bolster the view we want. And so that's, that's a challenge Jesus was constantly putting out in front of people, is what's your motive behind what you believe, you know? And uh, it's fascinating. Aldous Huxley, you know, um, in, in his book, uh, Ends and Means, had a quote where he's talking about his, when he was young, his atheism. And he said, I had motives for not wanting the world to have meaning. Uh, consequently, assumed that it had none and was able without difficulty to find satisfying reasons for this assumption. It was interesting that he said that. He's like, I had motives for not wanting the world to have any meaning. And so I marshaled arguments too. And he goes on to talk about my meanings were political liberation from the system I was under and sexual liberation. He's like, I found a belief in a God and moral laws constrictive to me sexually. And so my friends and I punted it. And it was interesting for him to be open about that. It was like, I arrived, I I was not this impartial judge when I arrived at my atheism. I wanted atheism because it helped me do what I want to do. And... Does that mean all people who are atheists think about it quite like that? No. But what it means is part of the challenge for people who aren't uh, believers is to say, why do I believe what I want to believe? Am I willing to seek truth no matter where it leads? What if it leads me to have to submit my life to God? Am I willing to do that? And often what you'll find is, no, I don't want to. And then you have to analyze where that comes from. And a lot of Christians need to analyze that. They they maybe believe right things, but for wrong reasons. And part of the journey is is going, uh, I want to know truth and uh, and let it change me, whatever it might be. So I just want to challenge people with that. Um, our problem biblically is that no one seeks God. That's what Roman says. And so God in his mercy has to open our eyes to see, incline our hearts to want the truth. 
And that's when the miracle begins of God saving people is when he's inclining us towards it uh, because we don't know the truth in our natural state. And often it's because, uh, yes, we're captive, but we're willing captives. We don't yeah. want the truth. And, uh, and so it's beautiful that even into that, Jesus prays, well, Father, forgive them. Lord, move in power in their lives. And what's beautiful is that prayer is answered. By the end, mm -hmm. their eyes are opened and they're praising God uh, because they got a glimpse of Jesus. And that's my hope for, for anybody, everybody listening to this, yeah. that they would get a clear view of who Jesus is. Go on that journey to find out who he is. No one changed history like this man. Do the work of reading about him. It's worthy of your time and study. Don't just buy into assumptions you heard once, maybe at a party. Dig into who he was, because the more you press in towards him, the more true and satisfying you'll find him to be, and that'll change you. So that's my hope, and that's why I wanted to unpack that. But yeah. uh, anyway, thanks for letting me ramble on. No, Anna. that was great. Yeah. Well, folks, thanks for tuning in. Next week, we're going to be in Reed Arena and all sons and daughters will be with us um, leading worship. So make sure and come out. And if you can't come out, uh, catch us on live stream. Um, go to our website around 9 p.m. on Tuesday and you can click on the link and uh, see us there. So we'll see you then. Thanks. Thanks.